Hello everyone, Pally Tub here and welcome back to Baldur's Gate 3. I have a doozy of a build in store for you guys today. I've played through the entire game with this setup and it is extremely strong. Even from Act 1, you can get it off the ground. But as you get into Act 2 and Act 3, you become an absolutely unstoppable monster. I'm of course talking about the Radiant Orb, Light Cleric. Such a crazy strong setup. We are really relying on Spirit Guardians, which I like to call Swirly Whirlies. If there's ever a slip of the tongue, that's what I'm talking about. Spirit Guardians allows us to deal radiant damage around us. And in this setup, as we deal radiant damage to our enemies, they are going to be debuffed a ton. With each debuff that we apply, we're making it less likely that every enemy will be able to attack my party. And I'll show you exactly what I mean right now. We went ahead and started a fight with the guards by casting Flame Strike. This is a high level cleric spell. If you are in the light domain, you're going to be using this a lot because it has that great fire effect, but that even better radiant damage effect. Now, with our gear set up right now, we are generating radiant orbs every time we deal radiant damage. These orbs lose a stack with each turn. So we have 10 stacks on this target right here on the very first turn of combat. But these stacks make it so they have a negative one to their attack rolls with each stack. So basically, it's a 10 increase to my AC if that guy wants to hit me. I have a 21 AC as my cleric right now. That means this guy either needs to roll a natty 20 to sneak that damage in or a 31 with all of their hit modifiers. Not too likely to happen, if you ask me. I don't think it's going to happen super quickly. Now, on the first round of combat, that is when I'm the most vulnerable. So if I can just spread my swirly whirlies around to the best of my ability, that is going to help protect us. But when I say we're protecting our entire party, this radiating orb debuff is not just for the cleric. That's everyone in the party that is basically going to have 10 more AC because of these 10 stacks. Four more AC. Four more AC because of their stacks. And over the course of a conflict, it can really protect your party a ton. Now, this guy at the bottom of the hill is the one who's most likely to hit me because he doesn't have any radiating orbs on his character. I have played four hour plus stream sessions with this build where my character did not take damage. That is not hyperbole. We have VODs to back it up. Now, of course, as I'm, as I'm talking about this, I'm sure I'm about to get my face smashed in. But so far, so good. Everyone is still missing. And again, that is simply an effect of us doing radiant damage against these enemies. So far, no one has landed an attack yet. Let's see if that changes. Oh, as they walk in, they spread even more radiant damage around. These guys all have 10 stacks of the deep up. If I was super worried about this guy who's far away from us, there are a few things we can do to spread the debuff over to them. One of those is to simply jump. Now, normally you would be worried about attack of opportunities. I am not because none of these guys will hit me. We have already placed the debuff. I'm not worried. So... That means I can walk away from all of these melee combatants, jump in on the archer on the far side. Number one, we knocked him down because of our boots. Number two, we applied four radiating orbs already. And because I didn't use an attack, we could just swing on this guy to make that nine radiating orbs. Basically meaning he has to roll a 30 if he wants to deal damage to me with that bow of his. Because we moved away from all of these guys that are only melee attackers, they are going to be forced to run back into my swirly whirlies, refreshing the debuff placed on them. Once again, I have not been hit a single time in this conflict, and we get free damage as they all move back in. The only thing they could do is push me. Ugh. They're trying to heal. They're trying to make it work. I'm once again going to just assume that I am immune to damage here. And I'm going to take my swirly whirlies for a tour right through all of these attacks of opportunity. Once again, this is just how strong this setup is. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to get this put together, all of the gear you need to make it happen, as well as the choices I would make while leveling. I'll show you the best gear in Act 1, Act 2, and then 
I'll meet you right back here in Act 3 and show you the best setup, I think, for this build. The first item we're going to need is here at the Selenite Outpost in Act 1. This is how you get to the Underdark from the Goblin Encampment. Now, there is a series of lockpicks that you can do over on this side and also a perception check to find a secret doorway. We can skip all of that as long as you have enough strength in your legs to be able to jump up to the second floor here immediately next to the ancient teleportation circle. Trapped. This opulent chest is trapped, so we are going to need to disarm it. And after that, still pick the lock as well. But once we get everything open, we are going to be rewarded with the luminous armor. When the wearer deals radiant damage, they also cause a radiant shockwave. We are a level five light domain cleric right now, and the only piece of gear we have on is the luminous armor. This is basically your starting point for when this build can start to come online. We are going to precast near every encounter, if we can, our spirit guardians to get radiant damage swarming around our character. This does require our concentration and last 10 turns. Now that we have that running, I'm going to open up these barn doors and see what's going on inside. Hey, look at that. We even get to go first in this encounter. This makes our job even easier. This is best case scenario. Because I used my action before the conflict started, I have an action to start this turn with as well. This is one of the reasons you may want to play as a light domain cleric. We get another radiant cast. This is Radiance of Dawn. This is my Invoke Duplicity, so we can't do it all the time. But as you can see, we deal good damage on the way in. We then walk in with the Swirly Whirlies to get Radiant Orbs on our target. The uh, Bugbear on the left, he is Bugbear, right? Yes, he has a four Radiant Orb stack and the Ogre has a four as well. With our AC of 19, that means these guys need to roll 23s to be able to hit me. All the while, if they move away, we get an attack of opportunity. If they stay inside of our Spirit Guardians, we could just move away and then run back in to deal damage just like that. We do see the Ogre getting pretty mad. We do have a warding barrier that we can use to try to protect ourselves, but it looks like it did not work out. Now, all we do to keep this combo going is walk back in range of the Ogre, deal that damage with the Spirit Guardians, and then restack up those Radiant Orbs because they were starting to fall off. Again, this is the weakest this is going to be. Adding three to four to your AC may not seem that impressive yet, but you just wait. Hey, we dodged another attack. So she walks out of the Spirit Guardians. We just walk the Spirit Guardians back in, deal that Radiant damage and take them down. Because Spirit Guardians last so long as well, it's not like you're really going through a ton of spell slots. You just kind of cast it, let it sit there, and then maneuver around the battlefield as needed. Once your party is able to make it into Act 2, this is going to be one of the locations you want to stop at immediately. We are south of the Last Light Inn at the Ruined Battlefield, is what this place is called on the map. You can see our coordinates over here on the right as well. There's a small ruined building that does seem to have an ambush going on inside of it. If we take care of this ambush, there is a chest nearby that has a vital piece of equipment. The chest we are after is located right here on this ledge. I mean, if you weren't looking for this, I feel like it could be very easily missed. Inside of the chest, we find the Illuminous Gloves. When the wearer deals radiant damage, the target receives two turns of radiating orb and those turns can continue to stack by the way this is only the beginning of the equipment that we can find here in act two there's some other really good pieces as well there are two rings inside of act two that you're going to want to keep your eyes peeled for as well the first one is underneath last light in we are in their dock area and through this door we can head to the cellars underneath the main inn Looks more like a jail cell to me, but what do I know? You do get a glimpse of a chest through some iron bars here, but you're not going to be able to reach them from that direction. Instead, we're going to cut south, pick the lock on this door, bash down this broken wall, pick the lock on this door, 
<laughs> then finally we can move towards the chest on the left. By the way, this is also trapped and locked itself. So make sure you bring enough tools to get through here. If you do all of that, you will be rewarded with, I didn't realize until right now I'd have to pronounce the name of this ring. Uh, the Coruscation Ring. I think I nailed it, actually. When the wearer deals spell damage while illuminated by a light source, they also inflict radiating orb upon the target for two turns. Next inside of the Gauntlet of Shar. This is just outside the area where you can talk to Balthazar after completing one of the combat encounters here inside of the Gauntlet. We are looking towards the northern wall in this room. There is a vault door that we are going to need to pop open. It uh, does require a roll of 30 to get this bad boy open, so good luck. I believed in myself. You could also unlock this with knock as well if you didn't want to do that much rolling. Now on the furthest right chest, you will find our other ring, the Callus Glow Ring. The wearer deals an additional two points of damage against creatures that are illuminated. Now that we have all of that gear acquired, let's check back in with our cleric. Right now we're just level seven, still of course in the light domain. I'm only wearing the gear that we have talked about, but I did throw on the Blood of Lathander. This does give us a once a day radiant cast that we can use, but not vital for our build at all. I did need a weapon equipped though, because it's very important that we are casting light on ourselves. Clerics do get this as a cantrip, so you can cast it for free every day. Illuminating our character is what primes our rings to really start popping off. Also, once we become a high level cleric and we have a bunch of spell slots, I love just casting daylight. It's so obnoxious with the amount of light that your character can give off. I find it really, really engaging. So now that we have light on us, there's not much else that really changes. We are going to be casting Swirly Whirlies, our spirit guardians, with the radiant damage. And there are some melee combatants over here that I think we could use as a great showcase to our build's power right now. Uh, so I'm just going to approach. Uh, they are all going to see me. We do not have alert yet. I don't think it'll matter too much. As the wrath, or the wraith, excuse me, comes into our range, we can see that it does get hit with a radiant orb. As we attack, we deal radiant damage, which stacks up even more radiant orbs. So this guy needs to roll an additional six in order to hit our character. Keep in mind, our AC is 19. So he's gonna need a 25 in order to be able to hit us. These guys are getting some swings in there, but with the Warcaster perk, we're maintaining our concentration, no problem. The Mastiff moved into our range, took damage, and now has six radiating orbs. Uh, I am going to approach a little bit closer. We can spread around the Spirit Guardian damage, but let's not forget, we do have the Radiance of Dawn. We can cast radiant damage on everyone here, applying radiating orbs to everyone here, and making it so they're gonna have a very hard time hitting me. Let's go ahead and end our turn. If they walk into melee, range that's best case scenario we see seven radiating orb stacks on this guy as they do their turn their stacks are going to be lowered but at the rate that we are applying these radiating orbs we should very easily hey there we go beautiful aoe damage as that guy walks into our effect now these two guys do have attacks of opportunity against us they have 10 radiating orbs which means they need to roll a 29 to be able to hit me if we're worried about that, one thing we can do is simply disengage, walk this way a little bit, and then walk back. And, oh, I thought that would deal extra spirit guardian damage. By the way, if you're wondering why I can't move, it's because we're over encumbered. Uh, that strength drain <laughs> really hitting us where it counts. As this guy walks back in, you can see we take no damage. The turn order comes back around to us and we explode once again for all of that radiating damage. Uh, he has 10 stacks of radiating orbs, so I could sit here all day, and it's very likely he would never be able to attack me again. I'm just going to continue to skip my turns here and watch as he continues to miss. And once again, this is not just stacking up the defense for Lazelle. Everyone that has radiating orb stacks will struggle to hit everyone in our party. It's so good, though. 
Like, it's so good, bro. Come on. <laughs> there is one more piece of gear that I want to draw your attention to. I don't use it in my setup, but it is the Holy Lance Helm. You can pick this up on the transition into Act 2. It's at the Rosie Morn Monastery. It's up on the roof, so as long as you climb up to the roof and do some jumping challenges, there's a chest up there that you could find with this inside. The reason I don't use it is if someone's close enough to me already, they're already going to be in my swirly whirlies. Yes, the radiant damage that this thing pushes off would combo with our radiant orb setup. I just don't think it's needed at all. All, even through the gearing process, I think you're going to be totally fine without it. And there are definitely better helmets in Act 3 that I'm looking forward to. But I just wanted to bring this up. If you wanted to grab it, it's an easy pickup at the monastery. As soon as you make it into the lower city of Baldur's Gate, you're going to want to make your way over to one of the first buildings on the right-hand side. This is the Stormshore Tabernacle. This is the basically religious mecca of Baldur's Gate. If you want to pray, you come here to do it. The guy who looks after this store does not sell a ton of stuff. Things, child, you have come far, I perceive. But what he does sell Only is pretty good. Today. We are very interested in the Sacred Star. This is going to do radiant damage with every attack, but it's also going to apply even more radiating orbs when we do decide to start swinging. As far as leveling our character, it is pretty straightforward, but there are some small things you can do to min-max along the way, and I'll try to point those out as we go. We are a level one cleric right now. We are a light domain cleric. We are going to specialize in spreading our radiance everywhere we go. For cantrips, I would probably recommend you start with Produce, fl Flame, Guidance, and then Blade Ward. Uh, we are going to get the Light Cantrip for free, and that is actually an important part of our character build, believe it or not. For our stats, I would do something like this. We have 10 Strength, 14 Dexterity, 16 Constitution, then 8 Intelligence, 17 Wisdom, which is our primary stat, and 8 Charisma. If you go for the 17 Wisdom and you want to min-max, it's important that you help the hag in Act 1 and take a piece of her scalp with you. If that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> a lot of this game doesn't out of context. Don't worry, you'll get used to it. But that would allow you to get 18 wisdom, which then it just takes one ability score improvement to then bring it up to 20. If you don't want to do that, you are going to have an odd wisdom. So you might want to bring that down to 16 and then just take the ability improvement to 18. We do want our constitution pretty high because it is important for our concentration checks. And there are going to be ways that we increase this later in the game, and you can respect for that as well. The cool thing about leveling as a cleric is all of your spells are available to you, and you're just preparing what you want to for the start of the day. So I skip forward to level four because there's no important decisions that we're making with these spells. We're just acquiring them as we go. Assuming you helped the hag, your wisdom would be 18 by this point, And then an ability improvement score could easily bring that up to 20. In this situation, I'm not able to help the hag, but this is what I would do in the in the ideal environment. I'd be at 20 wisdom right now with my first feat. At level eight, we're gonna gain access to yet another feat. For this one, I am a very big fan of Warcaster. Makes it so our concentrations are not going to break as often. And at level eight, you are gonna be fighting some enemies that are relentless. So picking this up now just helps to protect our spirit guardians, our swirly whirlies, and keep them active even longer. Now at level 12, I would take Alert as my final feat. This would make it so we can go earlier in combat more reliably. Let's say we don't have that initial setup time to get our Swirly Whirlies, our Spirit Guardians going. All we have to do is take Alert, and then we're probably going to go before most enemies anyway. If you wanted to pick this up earlier, I think that's also totally fine. But like I said, in most situations, I'm going to be setting myself up for success by Spirit Guardian before the danger even happens. Next, I'll show you the gear that I would take in Act 3 to kind of round out everything and finalize our build. I do think I was too harsh on that helmet earlier. I do think enemies miss enough that you'd be popping off 
with damage relatively well. However, for the end game, I do recommend the Helm of Baldurin. You find this in a secret area underneath the city. Good luck looking for it. The Cloak of Displacement is going to give every enemy disadvantage on attacking us until they land one of their attacks. Oh, like so that's going to happen. So basically every enemy basically just has disadvantage against you all the time. It's kind of ridiculous. Kind of ridiculous how good that is. You find the Cloak of Displacement on the bridge to enter the Worm Rock Fortress in Act 3. I am using the Bone Spike Boots. I really like them because against most enemies, you have a very high chance of knocking them prone, which limits their movement quite a lot and keeps them closer to the Swirly Whirlies. And then for our necklace, we did pick up the Amulet of Greater Health from the House of Hope. I am using this shield. Uh, it gives us plus three AC instead of plus two that most other shields in the game give you. There's also one that you can pick up inside Moonrise Towers that gives you that plus three AC. You don't need all of that extra fancy stuff thrown in on top. Hey, Steel Watch, could you do your job? I'm a menace to this city. What, what are you doing? Land your attacks. The shield, by the way, comes from the House of Grief. The arranged weapon I'm using is the Fabricated Arbalist. This comes from taking down Gortash. And it does allow you to do illuminating shots, which do carry over that radiating orb onto your enemies. So you can even apply them at range easily without spell slots. <laughs> I don't even think the Steel Watch can land a hit on me, dude. These guys are just gonna be running me all over the city. and That's gonna cause so much more trouble. Obviously, you don't have to solo the game with this build either. I do that a lot in my demonstrations just to show you how powerful certain setups are. And I think this one is like, it's hard to deny how fortified our character is, even without doing anything extra. We're just kind of running after these guys. It's a very, very simple play style as well. As always, if you guys enjoyed today's video, please be sure to hit that thumbs up button. Every single like we get helps us out a ton with the YouTube algorithm, and it is always very much appreciated. I think I would bring this build with me into honor mode. I think it's one of the most busted things in the entire game. If you agree, let me know down in the comments. I think there are few builds that could protect a party better than this one. <laughs> Not even a scratch on me, bro. Nothing to it. Take care, guys. I'll see you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the content. It means the world to me.